bringing up on stage a great man. I'm bringing up on stage someone who has seen it all, someone who has been there, done that, and is here to tell us how he is doing it. I know your hands are not too busy, so please put it together as I bring up on stage Ray Yusuf. What's up, everybody? Second year. Here we are. It's my honor to be here. I want to thank you all for being here. I love Africa. I love Bitcoin. The order is up for contestion. But what I want to share with you here today is my journey. My journey towards understanding my place in all of this that we're building and our place. A lot of people think that Africa needs Bitcoin. Bitcoin is very useful in what we're going to do, but make no mistake, it is Bitcoin that needs Africa. The work that has been done here by the traders on the ground has been tremendous. We're going to take some steps on understanding all of that. But first, we're going to fix some mistakes. We're going to crush some tricks. What are we looking at right here? It's a map of the world. You see that light green? That is the map that they give us. You see that darker color? That is the actual size of the continents. Who's the heavyweight champion of continents? When you look at that map. They have been lying to us about a map. So what else are they lying about? They're lying about everything. And the lie is always total and complete. Let those words ring in your ears. Because that is what must define us. We do not believe a damn thing that they say. So this journey is going to be about our heroes. We're going to talk about our ancestors right now. Who knows this man? Who knows this man? Malcolm Shabazz. This man right here is one of my heroes. One could say he's the greatest man of the 20th century. He sacrificed his own life to give us the truth. When you're growing up in America, wherever you're growing up, how many of you all thought Malcolm was a bad guy? An extremist, a violent person. I did. Then I had to dig deep for the truth. This brother gave a speech in Cairo. They got some people very mad. And he ended up with one of these on his back. I'm wearing it right on my chest. <laughs> Now's the time, guys. It's not, it's not time to hold back anymore. So Malcolm had a great saying. He had many great sayings, but one of his sayings is, if you want to move forward as a people, if you want to fix things and make lasting change, then we must know how we got here. But let's be honest with each other. We Africans, we have a self-esteem problem. We have a self-esteem problem. Why? Because everywhere you look across mainstream media, the only image you get of Africa is poverty, disease, and corruption. If I were to ask you, Africa is the richest country in the world as far as natural resources, as far as youth, as far as population growth. Why then is it the poorest country in the world? What is the answer? Corruption, right? It's always corruption. It's always the big C word. And where does that leave us? Chasing ghosts is where it leaves us. With nothing actionable to move forward on. Our leaders are corrupt. But our people always get the leaders they deserve. So what does that make us? We're corrupt. We're incompetent. That's what they want us to think. Well, I'm here to wipe all that away. And I'm going to have fun doing it. I hope you're keeping up over there, sister. With some of this, it's going to be untranslatable. <laughs> all right, guys. So let's go through the journey here. We're going to honor our ancestors. 
How many of you know who this man is? Raise your hands if you know who this guy is. You're doing better than me. I just learned who this guy was yesterday. I'm being totally honest. This man was the leader of Togo. He met JFK in 1962, flew over to Washington. And these two brothers sat down and they made plans. The same kind of plans. They sat down and JFK said to him, hey, this central bank that runs my country, the richest, most powerful country in the world, is not owned by the people. I don't even know who runs it. We have to pay them to print up our money, and they have us in debt for doing nothing. I'm going to print up my own money, and he did. And my man, Sylvanius here, said, you know what, brother, I'm going to do the same thing, because we have the same situation over in Africa with the Central African Bank, the Bank of West Africa. And he did the same thing. These two brothers were assassinated within months of each other. So it doesn't matter if you're in the West, if you're in the global South, the East, Africa. This is the same struggle that unites us all. It doesn't matter how powerful you are or how many soldiers you have. This struggle unites us all. We are firmly in a battle. And right now is the time. The stakes have never been higher. We are all playing the great game, whether we refuse to realize it and accept it or not. Me, personally, I'm loving it. As scary as it is, with innocent suffering and dying around the world, I consider myself honored to be here right now. My mother and my father, who left Egypt, left Africa 40 years ago, went to America to make a better life for me and my sister. They suffered. And all their suffering has led me here so that I have a platform to avenge them and make a better life for my children and all of our children. Who's feeling, feeling that ancestral energy right now, right? Think about the eyes of your mother. Yeah, think about the work of your father. And think about all those that came before them. We're not up here alone. We are not alone. How many of you know this man right here? Right? Yeah, this is one of my ancestors right here. This brother was the leader of Egypt, and he was the last great leader of Egypt. We just got a bunch of sellouts right now. It's sad. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say it. Us Egyptians have fallen far, but it's okay, no guilt. This is all about understanding how we got here. This brother was killed, assassinated by the guy that replaced him. And the guy that replaced him was take killed by Mubarak. And then Mubarak was removed, and now we have a dictator in charge of Egypt. You know what us Egyptians are known for these days? Besides our great hit sense of humor and our cooking, we're the number one torturers in the world, and we torture ourselves. <laughs> Falling far, right? But it's okay. We move forward. This man was a hero. He understood the power of the streets. He spoke with love, energy, a calmness that won over the Egyptian people. Egypt used to be the crown jewel. Of Europe, people, all the Europeans would come there to cosmopolitan Alexandria and Cairo and have a great time. Egypt is not that anymore. It suffers from massive inflation. My mother just lost half her life savings. The banks, the Egyptian banks robbed her. This is the situation that we're in. So the bad guys might have the media, they might have all our politicians, they might run the banks, they might have the biggest navies in the world, but we got the streets. We got the streets, eight billion people that all understand what's possible. And we're gonna help them along by focusing on the right thing. The power of the youth, right? If you're over 21 years old and you haven't made it so far, you're probably not gonna make it. But this man, Thomas Sankara, you know, what was his country? Burkina Faso. This man was in power for just four years before they killed him. Every single progressive African leader has been assassinated by the West. So when they look around, they tell you, hey, Africa's corrupt. How could it not be corrupt 
if all of our good leaders see what happens. All of our leaders see what happens to the good guys. So they have to make a choice. So wipe that word away. Africa is not corrupt. The Pentagon just lost $3 trillion. And no one's looking into that. Instead, they're looking at a brother selling $300 worth of Bitcoin. The West is more corrupt in a single day than all of Africa combined. Understand that. So do not let them shame us into feeling anything other than proud of how we got here. And it's only when we understand what our leaders went through that we can move forward. So I'm about to get a bit controversial right now. Some people won't like the next man on this slide. I know it's going to make some people angry. But that's kind of why I'm doing it. My man, Mugabe! Oh, I know some people want to throw some booze out right now, but that's all right. I was fooled too. The more they hate a leader, the more dirt they throw on him, the greater that leader was. When this man went into power in Zimbabwe, which was set to be the next Wakanda, right? But when he got to power, literacy was at 36%. Can you guess how high he got the literacy level up to before he had to vacate? 92%. The highest literacy rate in all of Africa and one of the best educational systems in the world. He also built up the agricultural sector so that Africans wouldn't have to go begging from bread from the West or anywhere else. Then what happened? When you say Mugabe, it's a dirty word. Even some people in Zimbabwe are disgusted by that. What happened was he was hit with some of the most crippling sanctions the world had ever seen. It made it impossible for them to import the things to keep their agricultural sector going. He could then not feed his people. Try as he might, the sanctions were that extreme. Maybe someone here should ask Tony Blair what he was thinking. He wasn't thinking at all. He was just taking orders. They saw that Zimbabwe was about to be a breakaway civilization. It was about to become the next Wakanda. And what happens? Bury them. Hyperinflation. Currency wars attack. They control the price of the Forex. They can say our currency is worthless if they want to with a few moves of fake paper money. And that's exactly what they did to Zimbabwe. Their system is still in shambles and is still a mess. What did he do to piss them off so much besides breaking away and trying to make his people rich? Well, he was an outspoken voice for the most oppressed peoples in the world. And he also started selling some uranium to Iran. That didn't help his reputation either. This is what they do to African leaders that defy them. They crush them, they impoverish their people, and they make them out to be tyrants. Is everyone here getting the lesson yet? Is everyone here getting it? Yes! Do not fall for their lies. It is only when we can defend our leaders and their honor that we will get the leaders that we deserve. Because they will feel safe to tell us what's actually going on. That is the power of knowledge and education. It is literally armor for our leaders so that we can work hand in hand. I hope you guys remember that. You got that, sister? Yeah? We all got to get the message, you know what I mean? <laughs> all right. A nice face right now. Nelson Mandela. This man is a hero. Yes? Yeah, he is. This man won. This man won. He only had to spend 20 years in jail. 20 years in jail by one of the most brutal regimes in the world. Can you imagine that? This was no county club prison. 
He spent 20 years in jail, just like the prophet Yusuf spent 20 years in jail. And when he came out, he came out a hero. Was this revolution peaceful? Hell no. <laughs> no revolution that works is ever peaceful. But because of the blood and price that our ancestors have paid, we are now armed with something that can give us a success, a win, without firing a shot. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But the last man on this list is very special. The last man on this list had a solution, and he kept it secret until the last moment was he, he was going to introduce this system to the world, and he was going to uplift all of Africa. Can you guess who I'm getting to right now? Yeah? You feeling my man over here? Yeah. My man, Muammar Gaddafi. Hero! Hero! Champion for his people. He took over Libya when he was 27 years old. What were we all doing at 27 years old? We were wasting our time in the club. This brother here, true African hero, he gave his people everything. Free water, health care, education, electricity, almost completely free fuel. And they call him a tyrant. Well, if this is what tyrants do, then bring on the tyrants, man. Bring them on. He also had a plan. This brother had 144 tons of gold. And he was going to introduce the African dinar, a currency for all of Africa, backed up by gold. Why is gold special? Because it takes work to make gold. It's kind of silly, right? You have to take it out of the ground, polish it up a little bit, and then put it back in the ground in a bank vault. Seems kind of silly, but it works. Bitcoin mining actually makes a lot more sense. What if there was a universal currency around when he was trying to affect this plan? Was at the last moment the plan leaked and someone started sending some emails to Miss Hillary Rodham Clinton, the senator of my former state. Hillary didn't take kindly to all this, so she sicked the dogs on him. Time's up, huh? I'm going to keep going anyway. <laughs> So I've got a solution too, guys, and Bitcoin is a part of that solution. We are going through right now the final stage of the peer-to-peer -peer revolution. It began with the internet. It began with all these peer-to-peer -peer devices that we can all hold in our pockets that everyone seems to have. Then we had a wave of startups all disrupting everything from transportation to hospitality, and they did disrupt everything except money. Then in 2008, we got Bitcoin, peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. The very first version of Bitcoin had 11 opcodes to build out an actual marketplace, just like eBay. Satoshi Nakamoto himself put that in there. Was the plan was to create commerce. That is the whole goal. Every currency in the world started out as a medium of exchange first and then became a store of value. But here in Bitcoin world, we've been going at it the exact opposite way. It's time to switch the rails right now. And who leads Bitcoin as a medium of exchange? Africa leads Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. Western Africa leads Bitcoin adoption by a country mile. It is the youth of Africa that showed me what Bitcoin is truly good for. Purpose over price. And to that effect... I have begun work on a protocol, a decentralized protocol, so that anyone can build a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace and compete with me and steal my idea. And I hope you all steal my idea. Because that's how we have to go into this thing. All of us together at once. That's the power of peer-to-peer. -peer. They cannot stop an army of mosquitoes, right? This will be done in two more weeks. Not at the end of the year, I promise. 
And I, whatever job I take, and I have just taken a new job, I'm kind of unhirable. No one would hire me. So a company called No One's did hire me. I'm thankful to have a job. <laughs> and they will be the first to build on SafeKit and share our liquidity with the entire world. People will begin to see the power of peer-to-peer. -peer. So I want to end it now. I want to end it with what we began it with. Our ancestors. We all have different religions here. We all came from different places. But we all remember the sacrifices that our parents made for us. Has everyone here managed to find it in their hearts to forgive their parents for the mistakes they made? Uh, still doing that self-work? You better hurry up because the pressure's on. We're not going into this alone. We are not going into this alone. All of our ancestors are with us. And we have to reach deep down back to the beginning of time. All those pe people and faces that we forgot and bring them to us, bring their memory to us. I know you African brothers and sisters respect and remember your ancestors. The only reason that they ever existed was for us right now, right here. That's how special each one of you are right now. Respect that kind of power and be proud of that. If you're going to be proud of anything, be proud of that. We have come a long way, and we are not going at this alone. Everything they took, we are building the energy now to take back, and we're going to take it all back. I love you guys.